I often would say to parents in my classes, look, we're not talking about perfection. You don't have to say, I'll never yell again. It's just the idea that, you know, the first step is to know that you want to yell less. Welcome to the Momnificent Podcast. This is the place where we help parents live a happy, healthy life with their kids. We're going to show you how to connect with your child and help them even in their most difficult moments as we hear from experts in the field. I'm your host, Dr. Karin Jakubowski, an international speaker, public school principal, and former struggling student. The Momnificent Podcast equips parents with science-based strategies to help you live a happy, healthy life with your kids. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. I would like to just formally introduce, this is Rona Renner. She was the host of the Childhood Matters, which was a radio show in San Francisco Bay area for 10 years and currently hosts About Health on the kpfa.org radio. She's a registered nurse, temperament counselor, writer, and grandma of five. And she's also an international parent book author of is that me yelling a parent's guide to getting your kids to cooperate without losing your cool that is like the million dollar question for every parent rona welcome to momnificent thank you i'm so happy to meet you i'm so excited to have you here today uh so i love starting out with what's one thing that you've done recently that maybe you haven't done for a while that just brings you joy Well, the bad news is that I fell and shattered my wrist. So in November, I did that, had a couple of surgeries. None of that brought me joy. I can tell you that. But last week, I started back at the local YMCA. And I got in the warm pool. And I got in the hot tub. And in the hot tub, I felt no pain. And it was ultimate joy just sitting there and remembering I had been in at the Y, you know, before the pandemic, and now I had the courage to go back. And it just, it was wonderful. It was just oh, wonderful. It, and it felt so good. Felt so good. Because is your arm in pain most of the time now still? Still, yeah. Oh, that's hard, huh? Yeah, that's difficult. Yeah. And then yeah. to, it's getting better. It's to getting be better. there without any pain was just like, ah, oh yeah. man, yeah. I, can, I can feel that. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. I hope uh, continued healing, speedy healing for your wrist. So Rona, can you just start out by telling us and for those listening, like what led you to write this book about, is that me yelling? You know, I wasn't a big yeller with my kids, my four children, but I did yell and my husband yelled. And when I became a temperament counselor at Kaiser Permanente in the pediatric department, I learned all about children's temperament and could talk more about that in a bit if you want. But parents would come and see me and I would meet with them. And what I would find out is that what they were really worried about was how much they were yelling at their kids, that that they felt like they were just getting frustrated, they were stressed. And they knew that it wasn't okay, but they weren't sure what to do. And so when I left working at Kaiser, when I finished my radio show, I suddenly had this open space and I realized that I wanted to write a book, even though there were a lot of parenting books out there. And I just realized yelling was the new spanking in a way, you know, that parents had a lot of parents had stopped hitting their kids because they had heard that it wasn't good to hurt children, you know, and to hit them. So yelling became a way to deal with all the frustration. And I, I knew from my own experience that kids really don't like yelling. If you ask children, they'll tell you they hate it when their parents are yelling and so I, I thought, how do I, how do I address this idea of understanding yourself? You know, in a way, it's like mindfulness, but I didn't want to call it mindful parenting because I wanted to reach all the parents who I had been working with who wouldn't resonate with the word mindfulness. Mm-hmm. And so I focused more on the idea of Is that me yelling? Like, how do I pay attention to what I'm doing? And then how do I shift my behavior to help my children understand how to shift theirs? 
And I, I noticed that you said in another talk where people would say just the fact that they read the title of your book and it was present in their living room, dining room, kitchen, just them looking at, is, is that me yelling? just consciously made them almost like check themselves to be like, oh, wait, what can I do differently? And it really actually brought a change, which is crazy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Sometimes all we need as parents is like a reminder, a little awareness. You know, you could be listening to the radio and hear something on the radio, just what you needed to hear. I often would say to parents in my classes, look, we're not talking about perfection. You don't have to say, I'll never yell again. It's just the idea that, you know, the first step is to know that you want to yell less. You know, there are people who don't care. They yell at their kids and they think that's a perfect form of discipline. And those people, you know, won't change. But if you decide you want to do something, that's the first step. And then you need some support in figuring out how do I do this? And that's what this book is all about. And I talk a lot about myself. And I say in the very beginning that one day I heard myself, I was upstairs and the kids were fighting and sibling fighting was one of the big triggers for me for yelling. And I went to the stairs and I said, Karina, stop yelling you know, and I'm yelling on the top of my lungs. And I had that moment of, oh, wait a second. I think I'm a hypocrite right now, right? <laughs> I'm the one yelling. Uh, duh. Um, so it's like self-observation. How do we notice what we're doing? But we we need to do it without judgment and with a lot of compassion. I feel like parents need to have compassion for themselves. It's the hardest job there is except maybe being a teacher, but but parenting is so hard. And if we're hard on ourselves, then we're not going to be compassionate towards our kids. So the first step is really being compassionate. Give yourself a kiss. Mwah. You know, every time you make a mistake, give yourself a kiss and say, okay, I'm going to track what happened, what I did and what I could do differently. And that in turn is also teaching our kids how to treat themselves. Right. Like it's, it's actually beautiful and twofold. Can you tell us the story of when you interviewed that seven-year-old boy and what he said about his dad and then what you noticed and observed from that, that you share with parents? Let me see if I remember. I think, I, I think, it, if, is it the do story you need me to help you? you asked him what he would wish for if he had a magic wand? Yes. You know, it, it was it was a child who I went to see the family because they were ha- having a lot of struggles. And I said, you know, if you had a magic wand, what would you wish for? And he and he said, I wish my father w- would not yell at me. And I don't remember what I wrote in the book because it's been so many years. But this father was really like in tears, yeah. realizing how sad he was that his child felt so bad about the fact that he was yelling at him. Yeah. And, and I, and I think I remember you, you just used that as the premise to say, Hey parents, there's no shame here. There's no blame. Like just be aware, but be kind to yourself. And in that, like you said, mindfulness or however you want to say it, I love how you bring out, just, just ask yourself, what do you, what do you feel? What am I feeling right now? What do I notice and what um, just to bring us to that present moment? Because like you say, there's so many times where we're living in the future and we're living in the past and we're really just not in that present moment. And one way to do that is to take a breath and just ask myself, what am I feeling right now? What am I thinking? And, and how could I reframe it? You know, if I'm thinking, oh my God, my kids are such brats. They're driving each other crazy. They're going to grow up and they're going to wind up in jail or something, you know, like you start to escalate. And then if you stop and take a breath and you realize, oh, right, they're just normal kids and they're, they're, they're cooped up in the house and they need to get out. Okay. So now that I calm myself, I can then decide, oh, what's needed. You know, when we're in a calm state, we could be pretty smart. You know, we we find the answers. I don't want to give parents the answers because parents figure out what to do, but it's it's changing that state that helps us be able to respond from a place of knowing 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, and so kind of on that note, I was I was curious if you could help me with this, 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 this thing that happened to me. I had a kid who was really upset and I it was after the fact. So I really do my best not to talk to a kid when they're upset and crying. I really give them that time to just calm down. And I, I like to use the term like when when they looked calm and in control of their body. Then we can talk through what happened. And I use this little like problem solving question process with them. And I said to the one kid, like, what do you think would help? Like, sometimes it helps me to take a breath and that just helps me like just reset and I'll think something different and act a little differently because I gave myself that breath. And they were like, that doesn't work. (laughs) And I'm like, oh man, I know it works. How am I going to, and I didn't try to convince them. I just was like, and if, and when you try it, it works for you. Awesome. And if it, you try it and doesn't work for you. Like, that's okay too. Is there anything you can help yeah, me with? When perfect. The kid's I mean, like, no. And I'm like, yes, it does. <laughs> right. We, we have to acknowledge, I mean, we have to be real and we have to be honest as much as we can and acknowledge, oh, okay. It doesn't work for you. I'm just curious. And I love the word curious. I mean, mm-hmm. curiosity is such a wonderful word for teachers, for parents. I'm just curious, has anything helped you? You know, whether you're at home or at school, has anything helped you when you're in that situation and you need to calm down? You know, and the child might say, no, <laughs> nothing does. Or they might say, well, yeah, sometimes if I suck my thumb, it helps. Or, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. if I um, if I get up and walk around and get a glass of water, that helps. But children often know what they need and what helps them if we ask and if we authentically are are really actually interested in them. So often we're busy and we're frustrated and we don't actually listen and pay attention to what kids have to say. Mm. So it's almost like really the intuition in each of us is there Mm. if we just take a minute and like sometimes it's just calming everything to kind of, okay, what's coming up for me instead of, I don't know what to do. I got to figure like, someone's got to help me do it. There actually really is the help within you and within your child, which is, I just love that. It's very empowering. Yes. And sometimes we're just going too fast. Um, And so we don't, you know, really slow down. And, you know, I've had parents say to me, look, I got to get out of the house in the morning. My kid is driving me crazy. They, they won't get out on time, you know, and I'm rushing and, you know, I, I work with them on strategies, like let's set a timer for 15 minutes before they have to be out so that they get their shoes and they find their jacket, you know, like, like there are strategies that can really help. So parents can be proactive, but if the child is really having a meltdown I say to the parents sometimes, okay, so what will happen if you're five minutes late? You know, like if you really need to be five minutes late because you've got to help this child calm down without throwing fuel on the fire, without yelling at them, it's not the end of the world. You know, so so we have to keep checking in on our rushing and our fast pace, because I think that really gets in the way also. And again, I feel empathy for parents. I know that you have to be on time for a lot of things, but you got to prepare ahead, you know, make those lunches ahead, help them pick out their clothes ahead, make sure they're getting up early enough, make sure they're getting some protein and something healthy for breakfast, because that's going to help their mood all day. Make sure you're getting something so that your mood is also okay. You know, there's a lot to think about as parents. And again, lots of sympathy, compassion for how hard it is, especially these last few years. Yes, even more, more than ever. It's like, it's for some reason, it, it's easier for people to just feel like they're on the brink of like, losing it, you know, and things, yeah. whatever, falling apart or, or, or just that feeling or thought of it. Um, I had a question come in that I wanted to ask you is, um, let me see here. So my child and I have absolutely opposite temperaments. And maybe you want to go into that a little bit. And we often butt heads. And when there's a conflict, how can I help us get to level ground? How should, how much should I compromise with my child? 
So temperament is the way we move in the world and we come into the world differently. So some children are slow to warm up, shy, um, they may be sensitive. Some kids have high intensity and high activity levels or, or they're very regular. Other kids are disorderly and unregular, you know, so there's this whole, these nine traits of, of temperament. And there's a wonderful book called Raising Your Spirited Child by Mary Kersinka, and she goes through all the traits. I think it's one of the best books. My book, Is That Me Yelling?, also has a, a good chapter on temperament. So our children might be very different than us. So for instance, this parent is saying they're different. So maybe the parent is um, an extrovert and high energy, and the child is an introvert, you know, slow to warm up and sensitive. And so the parent is trying to go, come on, let's go. You know, I'm impatient. It's time to go. And the child is taking their time. So what happens? We as parents have to first understand the differences and know that our children are different than us. So if I'm impatient, part of my job is to learn actually how to be a little more patient. Um, If my child is slow and slow adapting and has trouble with transitions, I've got to teach them, you know, again, setting a timer, making a list, really trying to help them do what they need to do. But I think the end of that question was about how to have uh, peace between you and not have the final final last word, right? You know, the piece is really acceptance, working with the child, and then not feeling like your siblings who are fighting. You know, we don't want those power struggles. So you give in a little bit like, okay, you don't like eating this food because you're sensitive. I'll tell you what, I'll make you something healthy for each meal and all of us will eat other things. And if you don't like them, at least you have this one thing, you know, instead of saying, um, you must eat and sit at the table until you've eaten this, and then the child will just sit there and won't eat it and you'll lose. Mm -hmm. Um, So there are compromises, you are the boss, you still set the rules, it's not about being a pushover. But there's this understanding of what makes your child tick. And if you could understand that, there'll be fewer battles. Like I was intense and one of my kids was intense. So we would escalate, you know, so I had to learn how to calm my intensity in order to teach my child how to calm their intensity. And and parents, you know, we have to regulate so that we can help our children learn to regulate. And and there's this idea of co-regulation, you know, like if you're in a more regulated state, you can help your child regulate as well. Mm-hmm. And then some kids are just going to keep pushing you. They're just, you know, their oh, temperature is just going to keep pushing you and you're going to learn and learn and keep looking at the blessing that they are, keep looking at what they have that's really good. And also understand that behavior has meaning. So when the behavior is really hard, there's some meaning behind it. And as teachers and as parents, we sometimes have to understand what's going on with this child. What do we need to know? And that takes time. And that takes time. And teachers. Which is what um, we're always fighting against. Yeah. And especially teachers, you know, you have. It's so hard. Kids in the class. You got to keep going. Right. They want to. They, at, right. at, at their heart is to really take that time with them for and, most students, and they most. struggle with yeah how do, how do you find the time and sometimes that's where it falls on the administrators because we have the time to sit with them and also when you sit with them is when you're building that connection and relationship stronger with them which is so powerful when a teacher has that with a child too yes yeah and I love how um you talk about think of think of a boss that you had or a boss that you kind of the character traits that you respect in a boss and how you, you kind of like talk about that being that with a kid. Do you, do you want to touch on that for a second? Yeah. I think that's one way for us to understand what our kids are dealing with. Like I could think about bosses who I loved and what did I love about them? You know, they were funny. Um, they didn't judge me harshly or or shame me. And, you know, they, they wanted back and forth cooperation. You know, when I think about bosses who I didn't like, they were often a little scary. 
Um, you know, often they would yell, you know, in front of other people, make me feel bad, um, or make someone else feel bad. And I would still cringe at that, and, and didn't offer the positive. So I mean, I think if we think of ourselves as parents as the boss of our children, we could think, all oh, right, they need positive feedback. They don't want to be shamed. If we need to discipline them, we need to do it in such a way that we're first saying something positive, And then we say, yeah, but we still have a problem in the morning when you're not getting ready on time. Or um, yeah, I love it that you have so much enthusiasm at night, but actually you need to go to bed, you know, whatever it is. But, but I think we can identify as adults with bosses who we respect and other bosses who we didn't want to have anything to do with possible. Yeah. I I think that's, that's a great way to look at it. When you said that, I was like, Oh, I made me think of it, you know, just a little differently. Um, Here's another question from a parent. How do you help deescalate situations when your child is frustrated about not being able to verbalize their needs? Yeah. You know, think about it. I can't always verbalize my needs. Most adults I know, you know, have trouble with it. So we expect our children to be really clear True. about what they need and, and, you know, say it in such a way that it's very meaningful. But in fact, often they can't. So I think that's when we sometimes can say, wow, I see you have really strong feelings right now. It looks like you're really frustrated or angry. You know, is that what's going on? And they may say, no, you know, oh, okay. I think I got that wrong then. Do you want to tell me where, what you're feeling or where you're feeling it? No. Okay. Well, looks like we're going to take a few minutes here and um, figure out what we're going to do. You know, so if they can't verbalize it, you want to accept what you see. I see you're really upset. You know, and children respond to that. They they want to be seen. Um, and so we help them by sometimes saying it and then being open to their agreement or not agreement. And over time, they can learn to say what they're feeling. Um, mm-hmm. But practice, they need practice. And, and we have to be comfortable with that. And a lot of us were not raised in a way to know what we were feeling. You know, like I remember growing up and it wasn't okay to be angry, you know, like anger. No, 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 that's bad. Or or um, sad, you know, that was even bad. So again, practice for yourself. Ask yourself, what am I feeling? You know, where am I feeling it? What am I feeling? And then with your kids, try and be curious about what might be going on for them. Yeah, I I just came across a picture book. It's uh, my mama says inside me lives a village and the author just uses cartoon characters of eight different animals to teach kids the different feelings. Because really, when you ask kids how they're feeling, it's either good, bad, sad, happy, like even adults, we have such a limited um, description of how we're feeling. Um, and so I just read that to a first grade class and they loved it. It was just so cool to just like talk about that so that they could recognize like the rabbit was sad or the, you know, he was, he was unhappy or cheerful or excited, or it just went through like almost like 15 or 17 different words to teach kids that it's there. Like, um, you know, you can, you, you notice the behavior but there's no judgment. That's what I love. That's why I teach it, teach the kids in our mindfulness lessons. Just notice what's co- what comes up for you without judgment, which is huge. Because um, sometimes growing up, you know, you were like, "Well, I'm not, I shouldn't feel that way," and then you know, you you feel bad, and and then you can't really like kind of work through it to move on. You know, Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown is an amazing book that you probably know. And it, I love her. About all the emotions that, you know, we, the words that no one really uses, um, yeah. you know, but yeah. the differentiation between jealous and envious and um, all the ways in which we might feel sad. Can you say the name of that again? Because I want to get it for my grandson. Okay. Yes. And, and, I'll, and I'll email it to you afterwards. It's um, my mama says inside me lives a village (laughs) and and I invited the author on my podcast and she didn't respond which I invite so many people and I'm so grateful when any of them respond you know but I got her book and I read it to one of the first grade classes and they 
they just like soaked it up. It was the coolest thing. And then I had them make a picture of one that they connected with. And then I challenged them to make an animal with a name of maybe another uh, feeling, you know, that maybe wasn't represented in the book. So just to really get kids to start thinking and talking about it to me was huge because nobody was teaching and talking me through that in first grade when I was a kid. And so if we can show kids that like it, 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 our, our emotions are there and it's not something to be pushed down, which I did a lot of growing up, like, okay, let's just, you know, there it is. And now what are we going to do with that? Beautiful. And if, if right? we teaching children in school, yes. about these things, and then again, having the curriculum so that the parents are learning it simultaneously, because, yes. you know, parents do the best they can with what they have and what they, they are. They are. I believe that yes. wholeheartedly. I do too. And I, I look at myself, I had my first child at 22, you know, and I'm 75 now. And, you know, I look back and I think, wow, I made a lot of mistakes and I have beautiful children and, you know, they were resilient um, and we want to teach resilience. You know, we yeah. want, we want to be there for them when they're struggling and know that, you know, someone's got their back and stay connected. And I think for any parents who are listening, who have teens, uh, preteens, I just want to say that, that staying connected, you know, not yelling, not shaming them so that they come to you when they're struggling, they need to know that you're a safe place. And we know that safety is really important for all children. So to the best of your ability, if you lose it and yell at your children, go back and apologize, say, you know, I'm really sorry. I I was upset and I yelled and I don't like it when I yell and I'm sorry. And um, I'm going to be working on that and do better. Don't add. And if you only listen to me, I wouldn't have to yell. You know, you leave that part out. You just come to a place with, with an apology and children then again, learn Oh, I can apologize when something goes wrong. So true. So true. Like I, I, I say like the kids are mirrors of us. Whatever, however you're, if you're yelling, they're going to end up yelling or just totally shut down, you know, and if you can take your, take a deep breath or whatever works for you to get yourself calm and in control of your body, they will eventually mirror and match you. And the same with, it's okay to say, Hey, I, you know what? I'm really sorry that I did or said that. And it's teaching them how to behave. Like that's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, let's pretend like you had all the moms and the parents sitting, sitting in this room with us right now. And what is just one thing that you want to just leave them with today? Be kind to yourself. Um, really find ways for self-care so that your cup is at least halfway full so that you can be there for your children. Cause if your cup is empty, you know, you're not, you're not going to be able to be compassionate. So figure out what it takes, you know, 10 minutes of meditation, five minutes of talking to a friend, um, a bubble bath, um, a run around the block, yeah, going for a walk going for a walk, something that fills you up some so that you could be grounded and so that you could approach your child with an open heart and know that you're going to be imperfect, um, but at least you're doing the best you can and, and really trying to understand who this little being is who is just surprising you every day, um, but you're going to keep coming back and figuring out what they need and what you need. I love that. Thank you, Rona. And so how can those of us listening find and follow you? Well, you know, I don't do a lot of social media or anything anymore, but I have a website, um, nurserona.com. And I post my radio shows. I do a live radio show in the Bay Area, but you can also hear it online. And I post all the shows at nurserona.com. And it says what the upcoming show is and and the previous show. So, um, and it says stuff about temperament and I have some videos there. So that's the best way. Mm, That's awesome. And so Rona's book is called, Is That Me Yelling? It's available in 
five languages, which I think is so cool, and a bestseller in China. And there you are if you're watching the video. She's showing it to us now. And here in the US, you can only get it now on Kindle until the next edition. That's right. That's <laughs> so, um, Arona, thank you so much for joining me. We've got for this episode of the Momnificent Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, I would be honored if you would subscribe and rate if you really liked it. I know wherever you're listening right now, it might not be the best time to leave a comment, but feel free to leave a question, a review, or a comment at any time. And until next time, remember, don't worry, be happy.